Some of you make me so deep, y'all. Come on now. Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. When you have it, say amen. Acts 16, 29. You have to say amen. amen. You don't? Say hold up. Acts chapter 16. Today I'm starting at verse 29. And I'm going to read down to verse 34. Amen? amen? Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 says, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You and your household. Verse 32 says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their stripes. And immediately, see, immediately, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Verse 34 says, Now when he had brought them into his house, he set foot before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. a faith, a faith. That, changed that changed their family. Their family. You all may be seated. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I pray right now that as I go towards this word, that you open up my mind and open up my heart, that you allow me to be an instrument and a vessel to minister to your people. Lord, we understand that in this season, families have been challenged, family has been divided, but we are believing and trusting you to bring back the foundation of the family. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. 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 And amen. A faith that changed their family. Family, I was raised in the time where no matter what you did all week long, on Saturday morning, we had work to do. I don't care what time you went to bed. I don't care how many movies you stayed up and watched. Saturday morning was for cleaning. Yes, it is. And I'm not talking about regular cleaning, Ron. I'm talking about unnecessary <laughs> cleaning. Why you lift the stove, Grandma? Why we washing the concrete? Grandma, why are we wiping down the baseboards? Grandma, Grandma, what is all these chemicals that I am smelling? I'm busy. I need a drink of water. I'm feeling a little lightheaded, Grandma. So one thing Grandma always did when she did clean is she always cooked. And not only did she always cook, she always cleaned, but she always made sure that the music was appropriate for the entire house. And the, the way the energy would flow through the house, and she would have some old school songs on and some stuff that we young bucks know nothing about. Play a little Otis Redding, a little bit of uh, a little old stylistic something that we knew nothing about. And they would go around and they would clean up. Then they would listen to that gospel music and they would make sure that it was always about what was really going to happen on Sunday. And I didn't find out until I got a little bit older that all that cleaning and all that cooking and all that prepping and all that daggone snapping peas and all that daggone chucking that daggone corn and all that daggone collard greens and my daggone hands turning green. I'm getting tired. I'm going to play my boots. I'm coming back. All that. Sorry, I had a flashback. I got PTSD. <laughs> was in preparation for family dinner. Yes. Yes. Family dinner has always been amazing, but family dinner always led to family 
Fights. 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 I don't mind. I don't want this going on right now. This cool mind shouldn't be here. You can't stop me, man. I see you when I get home. But one of the family fights that I never forget, my mother told me about was at uh, a holiday in my family house. And they were getting ready to eat. And um, my mother and my uncle Larry, I'm dropping names today. And my uncle Larry, I'm name dropping today. They got into an altercation. Physical altercation that started with the verbal, verbal, but it happened, Andrea, over some string beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was over some, some string beans. I don't know the whole details. Mind you told me this story. I wasn't there, but the family know that they set the whole family up, and it was all about the rolling around in the parking lot over some green beans. <laughs> I say all that to say that there's one thing about family that used to do is that we could fight, roll around in the parking lot, but what we always did was stick to. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look back from generation to generation, no matter what happens, we always had a strong foundation of family. Yeah. But what happened to the family? How do you know? The family was so powerful that even when nobody went to church, Big Mama went to church and prayed for the entire house. Yeah. And so much so that after she came from church, she would come home and have church again because she wasn't finished with church. Yeah. Now, you think you're home chilling and relaxing and, you know, that was just me. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And I wake up feeling like a piece of Popeye's chicken. <laughs> All because while I was sleeping and resting in the bosom of Jesus, my grandmother was laying hands on me, Father in heaven in Jesus' name. I speak right now to every demon. I speak right now. I don't need a blue And she understood that if nobody was going to pray, she was going to pray. If nobody was going to read the word, she was going to read the word. If nobody was going to feed you, she was going to feed you, your friends, your friends, friends, your cousins, your uncle up the street, the ones around the corner, and everybody else. Because that was when family was the foundation. I said all that to say in my introduction. So what happened to the foundation of family? I believe that the, the glue that kept the family is no longer here. And, and if it wasn't for Big Mama and the, the elderly, the family would never have been getting together. But my question is this. What have they taught us, trained us, prepared us for? Because I can promise you some of them are rolling in the grave. We knew that, and we knew that there was some non-negotiables. We knew that you could do anything on Monday. You can turn up on Tuesday. You can go for a walk on Wednesday. You can go be thirsty on Thursday. You can be fried on Friday, but Saturday, and you that you can go be sitting somewhere on Saturday, but Sunday you do. Yeah. Sunday, I need to be at my family's. My family house. Why? Because when I come to my, my family house, I can I should be able to come and be myself. I should be able to come and be able to fellowship. Why? Because wherever you got family, there should be fellowship. Say fellowship. fellowship. So here we understand that, that the family has lost this, its niche, it's lost this connection, and now we are so busy doing everything else that we don't have time for our family. And now we, we went from fellowshipping on a, a family. Now we, we went down to a, a text message. We used to sit down and, and at least, at least I didn't see you all year long. I knew that we could at least sit down and have some chicken and some 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 sweet potatoes and, and some some collard greens and some some macaroni and cheese and some candy. Oh my God! Hot shot by come on, Lord. And some rolls and some cake and some some lemon pie and some double egg and some seafood salad. Hallelujah! Oh, Jesus. You know it's good when grandma making a potato salad. When you see grandma cooking a potato salad and grandma wash her hands in it. When you see grandma pick up the spoon and put the spoon down it. They say put your elbow in it. That's what they really meant. Because you know you got to get them taters in there. You got to get to the bottom and scoop the side. But now it seems like the family's so busy and running and going that we have lost our connection with family. Yeah. Yeah. 
But here today in our text, say what's the text say? We see, first off, let's, before we even get to the family, we got to see Paul and Silas. Before I tell y'all what's happening here, I got to tell y'all what happened there. So as we get to our text, let me give you a little backdrop to this story. We have Paul and Silas. Paul was a tent maker from Tarshish who was called and anointed and appointed by God. But when he was called, anointed, and appointed by God, he was already living as a sinner. What was he doing? He was riding around killing Christians crucifying him. But what happened? He met his match one day and God knocked him off his high horse, humbled him, and asked him, he said, what must I do to be saved? So what am I saying? That everybody in here today must have an opportunity and an experience to meet God. Even, and when, even when you don't want to be him, he will meet you at the most unusual place and the most unusual time. Is there anybody in here who can testify that I was not born in church with the Bible in one hand and the hymn book in the other hand? God had to come and get me off of Pennsylvania Avenue. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And y'all wouldn't be social up in that club at the art. Is there anybody in here who can say, God, let me go back and get some of y'all. God had to come get me. Let me come down a little bit more. God had to come get me from Volcano. Y'all ain't gonna talk back to me. He, or he had to come stop by Odell's. Or he had to pull up at Melbourne. Is there anybody in here who can testify that God saved me when I wasn't thinking about him? And I can tell you right now, if God, oh, let me go get my young people. When you was at Trilogy, come on, when you was at the Aquatic Passing out both shows to church. <laughs> Everybody's in service, Jesus. So, so now, what happens? He says, Listen, I met him there, and now he, he got himself saved, and he started doing the right thing, and he started living for Jesus. And how many people know that when you start living for Jesus, life don't always get so much easier? So now what happens, he's living for Jesus and he's serving the Lord and he's going around, he's preaching and he's planting churches. And he's preaching and he's planting churches and he's preaching and he's planting churches. At some point, guess what happened? Uh, 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 the, the people attacked him. They says, oh no, bro, you Paul, and well, we got to do something about you, but let me fast forward. They got locked up and it was a central book. This is my story. Central booking. It was a central booking. And it was on the steel side. And it was, I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says. I'm blocking y'all. It was on the steel side. It sounds cold though, right? It sounds real on the wrong. I don't know about that. I did a little time. I'll tell you that another story. That's another time for another day. So now what happened? It was on the steel side. And it was on the steel side. Don't know. That's like, that was the one. Anybody else Bro, anybody else know they call camp on the road? You see the only one laughing. So he said, oh, they were from the steel, so they were locked up. And he says, okay, we in prison. So how were they in purpose and in prison? Oh, they were walking in purpose and they ended up in prison. So purpose don't always put you in a place that you expect. But sometimes purpose can put you in a place where you don't expect, but just because you're not where you expect to be, don't mean you're not in purpose. Because even where you don't supposed to be, God can meet you and get you where you need to be. Is there anybody in here who can testify that I wasn't always on the roll call straight, but God came and met me and got me together. I got all the way off over here and I warmed it off, but instead of God cut me off, he sent me curved me in and he came back around and gave me another chance to get things right with him. So he said, all right, they're not in prison, y'all, but even though they were in prison, they were in chains in their physical form, but their spiritual was free. How do you know? By how they operated. They weren't in there complaining. They weren't in there crying. They weren't in there stressing. If you go back and read Acts 16, the Bible says that they were praying and singing. They were praying and singing. They were in jail. They were praying and singing. They were in chains, but they were praying and they were singing. Is there anybody here who can say, even though I'm not in the best position, I'm going to still pray and I'm still going to sing. Why? Because they understood that it's who they're praying to is going to let them know that even if God don't deliver me, he's still able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible says they were all chained up there and they all were connected together. They were all connected. There was a whole bunch of them and they were all connected. And as they were connected, the Bible says that they were praying and singing. 
songs. They were worshiping. It was, I mean, they were singing the old songs, you know, how I made it over. And they were just going in and said, lead me, guide me along the way for. Oh, let me find out y'all old school here. If you what? I. People were going that what? So then they were saying, saying, Lord, let me walk. And the Bible says that they were singing, there was an earthquake. So what am I saying? That your praise has power to break some stuff off of you. So what am I saying? That when the enemy grabs you, that's not the time to get sad. That's not the time to be quiet. That's the time to make a joyful noise all ye land and serve the Lord with gladness. Why? Because it's my praise that invokes God's power. And it's God's power that breaks the yoke off the back of the enemy. So is there anybody in here who's in the middle of a storm, who's in the middle of a pain, who says, Pastor, I done lost a whole lot of things. I done lost some friends, I done lost some jobs, I done lost some relationships, but I did not lose my praise. I bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If you had not lost your praise, hey, Pastor, I'm still going to praise. I'm still going to praise. The Bible said that. Said, man, they were still praising and they got free in it. And the Bible says that they praised so hard that the jailhouse doors went open. Yes. 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 And at the moment in the text, as I fast forward a little bit and hasten, he says uh, that the person that was responsible for them was a jailer. He, he was a CO. I told you he was a CO. He was a CO, y'all. Yeah, he's a correctional officer at, at Central Booking and he was sitting down there and he was a CO and he was responsible for making sure that they did not get free. But my question is this why were they why did they have somebody watch them when he was already locked up? They were already in chains. They were already in a cell. Then they still had somebody to watch them while they were in the cell already in chains. Can I, give, can I use my exegetical imagination and let y'all know what I think this text is saying to me? This text is saying to me that the jailer understood how powerful they were. That the person that put them there understood that they could not keep them there. And I let somebody know that there's somebody right now trying to put you in a place and put you in a box. But I need to look at you there and say, neighbor, I'm too big for a box. You can't put me in no box. You trying to determine how I move, determine what I'm going to say, how I'm going to dress, how I'm going to walk, how I'm going to talk. It was God that woke me up this morning. It was God that started me on my way. And if you name me sweet baby Jesus, you ain't going to tell me what to do. I was born to be different. I was born to step out my comfort zone. That's why I can't fit in, because I was born to stand out. So stop crying when you to the cookout. Stop getting mad when you see the pictures. They didn't want you to come because they knew what you was bringing with you. So sometimes it's what they know about you. So, so here we go. Let's fast forward to now. We get to the point now, text where we see the jailer. He finds out that they're free. So when he finally see it, he, he freaked out. He said, whoa! I'm done. I'm fired. I'm done. Man, man, work. Where my ex-CEO is at? Don't, don't tell me who you are. I know who you are. So, so now, imagine being a CEO. Don't tell me who you are. And you got all your people, you, you watch them, right? And you did count. You did count. If they laughing, they might have been a CEO. You didn't count. Because if they don't know what it is, you didn't count. And he decide, I know y'all don't do it, but some CEOs decide to get a little Z's. <laughs> right, there you go, right, Pat? What are you going to do? Right? I got the key. They in jail. They got handcuffs. And they got them on their they hands, their feet, and I got the door locked. Sir? I think it's a good time we was praying, to get a little Z. Praying, so, we praying, yeah, praying. We and, and they were sitting there and they didn't say, oh, man, why you got to pray like this? <laughs> you lying there. So, you. <laughs> they were jail. They weren't going away. They were laying there. So they were laying there in jail. And the Bible said he, they, they, they saw him to sleep. They were sleeping. Oh, what a prayer we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs are bad. He's a holy hallelujah. Oh, 
So how can you expect to be forgiven if you never ask for it? So this man understood that this wasn't about his family. This was about him being the leader. So him being the leader and the provider for his family because during that time, women didn't work. So he was going to lose his life because he's already lost his livelihood. So now he's lost his livelihood. He's about to take his life, but then he's introduced to Jesus. How? He was introduced to Jesus through somebody else's bondage. So your faith is connected to somebody else, whether you want to admit it or not. So when we look, he says, first thing you think I got to do, come on, say, I got to admit. I'm a recovery, I, I teach, uh, I'm an addiction counselor by day, right? So that's what I do all day. So one thing I've learned that addictions come up the laws, make some noise, counselors in the house, woo woo. So when we figured out that we can't help nobody. Until they first admit they have a problem. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't care how much oil you pour on them. It's at the end of the day, until they admit that I have a problem, I'm going to stay stuck in the same place. What do you mean by admitting? That's simply owning up and fessing up that I have a struggle and I need help. So to admit, it means to let somebody in. The word admit, it means to acknowledge. So us as unsaved Christians, before we got saved, we had to admit that we needed a Savior. I admit I have sinned. I admit I have messed up. I admit that I have lied. Because you can't be forgiven for what you never admitted. So it's not that you struggle, it's not that you fall, it's that you have not taken responsibility for your actions. But the Bible says, every man must give an account for the deeds that are done in the body. So everything we old enough, big enough, and bad enough to do, we gonna have to answer for. So whether you're gonna serve them now, bow down now, or bow down later. Because the Bible says that every knee has got to bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So to them, well, you got to admit it. So he says, admit it. Well, you see, he says, listen, I'm admitting that I need it. Why? Because when you admit, you come become humble. He didn't walk in there with his chest all poked out. The Bible says that he went down. What am I saying? That in order to go up, you got to know how to go down. Yeah. The reason some people can't go up because all they want to do is go up and not go down. Because if you're willing to stay small long enough, come on, Edie Smith, if you're willing to stay small long enough, God will make you big enough soon enough. Yeah. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. So right now, I need you to realize that it's not always about being seen. It's not always about being on the front. It's always about humbleness. And humbleness is simply recognizing that my work alone comes from God. So if you don't clap me up or beat me up, I know I come from God. If you don't say good job and high five me and push me behind the back, I realize that my work alone comes from God. So then the one you say you gotta you gotta admit, say admit. So then admitting you gotta take responsibility for your actions and admit that I need a savior. I need somebody bigger than me to get me out this game. Hey, come on, my young folks here. And when I was young too, I didn't think I needed God. I didn't. I thought I was cool. I thought I had the answers. But when I found out the older I got. The more God been taking care of me when I didn't even ask him to. So now I realize that I cannot get to heaven off of my grandmother's faith. My grandmother couldn't confess my sins for me. I had to admit that I was a sinner in need of God's saving grace. So in order for me to do that, I had to humble myself. So my question today is this. Has anybody been mature enough to know that it was when I humbled myself that I got to see God move? It's when I humbled myself, I got to see God's hand. It wasn't until I humbled myself. Last thing about this is the Bible says, humble yourself. So pay attention well, why does God say humble yourself? It's kind of like a parent. You know, you want to tell your child to do something, right? But you don't want to make them do it. 
Because they're going to do it either way. So it's like a, 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 it's a trick question. Can you go downstairs and get me some ice water? That's my grandma. I want a big cup of ice and a Pepsi. Ice to the top. She would ask as a question. But it was no opportunity to say no. Think about it. That's, 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 that's Pete. You would ask me something, but not give me an option to say no. So you really was telling me while asking me. So, so what happened is, oh, I got you, got you, got you. So what happens is what God does is he gives you an option that's not optional. Because you're going to do it my way? You can do it your way. But either way, it's going to get done. So you would rather do it your way than my way. Because my way ain't going to be the way you want. Because if I got to do it, I may have to break some stuff. I may have to cut some stuff. I may have to take some stuff out your life. I may have to remove some people. I may have to allow you to lose that job because you think that job is the resource, not realizing that I am the source of all the resources. I may have to lose your boot or your bay because you was going to church every Sunday and now you got your little piece, a little friend, a little somebody that's smiling in your face that you done forgot all about God. You done praised God for the job and you done talked about the job and you need to post I thank God for the job, but now that you got the job, you don't even allow God to help you at the job, or go with you to the job, or tell nobody about him while you're at the job, and now you don't even take no money from the job to put back into the kingdom that you made the promises to. Is there anybody in here today who can thank God for humility because you realize that everything I got, it came from him, and I'm not boasting, I'm, I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, I'm simply testifying that if it had so number one, he had to admit, this, this jailer had to admit that even though I was in the position of a boss, I still needed help. Yeah. Number two, say point number two. He had to believe. Say believe. believe. Wait, what did he have to believe? He had to believe that Jesus died and rose on the cross. And what do you see today? The Bible says it right there in verse 31. It said, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But then it goes more. It says, you and your household. So hold up, hold up. They want not even They wasn't even there. They were at home. He was. He wasn't even at church. So, so you telling me that just because they not in, they can get saved and not be at church? Yeah. If you doing what you do right, you gonna bring so much Jesus home that you gonna be a walking church. So, so the text said. He says. Believe. That's his faith system. So a lot of times people make uh, trusting God complicated. Make Christianity complicated. How do you get saved? Salvation is this. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to. No, no, no. The Bible says it right here. It says believe in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and he rose, you shall be saved. So if Jesus self told you how to be saved, why are you allowing other people to make you jump through hoops to get saved? Salvation is free. But it costs Jesus' life. So you don't pay for salvation, you simply receive it. So when you receive it, you don't have to pop by something that's a gift to you. You simply just say, Lord, I thank you. Is there anybody in here who can say, God, I thank you for the gift of salvation. When I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with end, seeking to rise no more. Then the captain of the sea, he heard my despairing cries, and from the water he lifted me. Amen. Say Am I? Why? Because it was God's love that lifted me. Because when nothing else can help, it was his love that lifted me. 
So he says, listen, you got to believe. So, so in order to, to understand, you got to accept it. And after that, you got to believe it. You got to believe that Jesus can do it. Yeah. But, but he didn't believe that Jesus could do it. And so he, he saw it. He saw two people that were bound. And when he saw them, they were free. He went to sleep. They were bound because if they were free, he wouldn't have went to sleep. <laughs> He wasn't going to sleep. He was stayed up. He was slow. He got comfortable. And what happened is while he was sleeping, God was working. So while he was sleeping, God was setting stuff free. God was moving some chains. God was shifting some stuff. God was breaking some stuff. God was manifesting some stuff. So why? As he woke up, they were free. So what am I saying? When people look at your life right now, do they see you free? Free people Free people. Harry Thomas said, I would have freed a whole lot more people if they only knew that they were in bondage. Is there anybody in here today who can testify that I am free and who the sun sets free? It's free indeed. And now you can testify that God has set me free from the chains of bondage, set me free from the chains of animosity, set me free from unforgiveness, set me free from discontentment, set me free from bitterness. Right now, just say I'm free. So, so, so their belief grew when they saw he saw these people so when people look at your life do they see the old you or the new you so he saw that they were different I saw that these guys are, are, have been changed they're not the same and now he says not only do you, you gotta accept not only do you gotta believe Come on, say, what's point number three, Pastor? You got to confess. Let's, let's work this a little bit. You got to confess. So, so we've already admitted that I need help. And I already believe that Jesus can help me. But now I get to see, now I got to confess. What is confess? I got to say it out my mouth. I did it. I got to accept that, listen, I, I, I did it. I, I made a mistake. I have sinned. I have fallen short. So I confess. And, I, and confession is one piece. So confession is not the same thing as repentance. Because the end goal is to, to make sure that it's about salvation. And these guys understood that I need to make sure that my soul is saved and secure. So how do I make sure my soul is saved and secure? By understanding that I got to repent. Say repent. Just confessing is not enough. You got to repent. Because now he says I got to repent. Why I got to repent? Because I need to make sure that when I get myself together, I want everybody around me to benefit from what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He, he said it right here. Verse 33. It says, and he took them the same hour of the night. So now he went from being taken in from church. So guess what? He got saved and he started serving. He got, I said it earlier, he got straight to work. And right there in the text, he said, he says, he took them and he washed their stripes. And he immediately he and his family were baptized. So what is baptism? That's a public declaration of an inward transformation. So I'm simply letting you. So next week, we got how many candidates? I said it wrong. I got a digress last week. I said the wrong number. That was wrong. Wrong number. I got in trouble for it. What's the right number? So I'm going to say the wrong number. We got 10 people getting baptized next week. Celebrate it. And if, if, you, if you want to sign up, make sure you see Lee Lady or see uh, somebody on her team and sign up and register. So what happens is you don't have to go to this church. We're going to baptize you anyway. We want you to be into the kingdom, not just in this church. So now what happens? He says, listen, I need you to realize that the baptism is what is going to show that now I'm changing teams. So that's why when you get baptized, you need to invite your family and your friends. Because what you're doing is I need to set up a new support system. So if you can't come back. Then come on now. Since I don't, I don't need you just to come to that. I need your support here. See, see, we can do a little bit of celebrating, but I, I, I'm going through some stuff where I'm suffering, and my spirituality is what helps me get through. So I don't need you just to be around when times are good. I need you to be around when times are hard. So now you got to make sure that you put yourself around some people who's going to support you and celebrate you. And the text says this. He says he sat before them and he fed them, and they got baptized, and they believed. And the Bible said that not just him, but 
for this whole household. Transforms. If, if the people in your house never came to church, never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, could they look at your life and want to know who your God is? So, so this jailer, right, he was in a situation where he understood that he could not save I need God. And how did he do that? He saw Paul in silence, but he believed in that God. He was, and I needed to get myself together. But his family, do it? It, it say that the church came to his family. I'm in the book. The Bible didn't say they went down there and they was having service on family and friends that on the street but in his ear. No, that ain't what it's saying. So what am I saying? God can meet you anywhere and see you. Because can you show this illustration quick? Y'all bring up, y'all bring up. So so real quick, I'm gonna show y'all a quick illustration. So now what happens? Y'all born and said our life simply sin right this is sin this is just sin this is you can't see what's going on in there you just know it's you come from heaven every good and perfect gift comes from above you heard it right we're innocent we don't know nothing just ourselves and going that way and sin has a way of Getting into our sin. Hold on, hold on, hold on, sin. <laughs> and then you find yourself dirty. And then every time you try to get rid of sin, you find yourself go. Some more come in. So now all you're doing is transferring dirt. So now you find yourself in a position where you. Sir. But when you came to him, you were filthy. Nothing in hand that he wanted. You were so unworthy. But the Bible says 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall be See, so then Jesus comes and you become holy and you become consistent and you become prayerful. Come on, and you become prayerful and you become fasting and you just keep seeking it and you just keep working on it and you just keep on working on it and you just keep working on it and you just keep cleansing you. And now what happens? Nobody even knows who you are. Hallelujah. Because he's my life up. And now we didn't just do that, but what God also did was he allowed you to be able to deal with all your stuff. He says, listen, I'll go ahead and handle all your stuff. But what he also said with this, I'm going to also take the... He spit on, mocked, backbit, lied on, betrayed, left, Forgotten, but he still took this. So if you just thank God, I need you to stand on your feet right now and put your hands together for thanking for, for washing you and for, for squeezing you and for giving you a fresh new start and giving you a fresh new day and giving you a fresh new opportunity and you believe it and trust God. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. So as I get ready to close this sermon, I want you to take a down yet. I want you to ask yourself, are you content with where you are in your walk with God? I'm not saying it got to be perfect, but... At this time, I would like to ask anybody, you take one step forward and get not 10 steps back, I want to pray for you. So I need you to do me a favor. Recognize yourself by... ...now that you be for them 
what they cannot be for themselves. I pray that you meet them right where they are at their appointed need. Who has a heavy heart, whoever got a stony heart, whoever got all these things going on with the enemy, maybe stealing their joy and stealing their peace. I pray right now that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, but every tongue that rises up in judgment, thou shalt condemn for this. Jesus' name, I pray. Come on, say amen. Come on, type it in the chat, amen, amen. Hey, listen, if you're watching this right now, I don't care where you are, you have an opportunity to connect with us. There are several ways to connect. One way you can connect by one is giving your life to Jesus Christ. Yes, you can. Give your life to the Lord. How do you do that? Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Jesus died. Pray the prayer of salvation. How do you do that? You say, Lord, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Rejuvenate me. Allow me to acknowledge and recognize. My next plea is this. If you are looking for a church home, and you say, well, Pastor, I don't even live in Baltimore. We have an e-church that you can partner with, be able to find out how can you connect with us. And if you're out there wandering, looking for a pastor, and you're looking for a place where you are loved and accepted, not judged and rejected, aha, I'm done. Stand on your feet as we prepare for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask, imagine a dream to the only wise God, be power, dominion, and may our dwelling. May the Lord bless us in the city and bless us in the field. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Have a fantastic week. Peace!